by Cynthia Lennon herself, who is such a reassuring presence in the book. Is it all terribly vivid to you still, or is it one of these things that you almost feel it happened to somebody else? Oh, I couldn't believe that it happened to somebody else. I mean, so vivid watching your, your film previously. It's so evocative and so still so very strong in me. Mm. Of all those stages that John went through, a student, a struggling musician, rich and famous musician, husband and father and so on, when was he most fully himself, do you think? Was it in the early days before the other influences got to work on him? Well, for me, um, for my time with John, which is about 10 years, spanned about 10 years, I feel that he, he came to his great happiness or contentment when he started to become successful. And I think that was the moment when he met Brian, um, the moment that his first record took off, Love Me Do, and Please Please Me. I mean, the excitement and wonder of it all were fantastic. The child that he had, Julian, he didn't have a lot of time to see or to, to be with, but it was also a fulfillment to him. And I think possibly, I feel that I had the best years with John. <laughs> it sounds very, very strange thing to say, but I feel that he was at his most content during, say, from 60 to 65. Mm -hmm. If the music hadn't taken off the way it did, uh, what would he have ended up doing, do you think? I mean, was he employable in any normal sense when, when he was at the art school? Well, he was, he was too individual to be employable. I mean, he was a, a rough diamond and, and a great talent and a nonconformist. And I feel that, well, in my belief in my time with him, I honestly believe that I would teach and he would carry on painting. Because I couldn't see him fitting into a nine-to-five job or, or doing anything like that. Mm. When you were married, uh, on your wedding night itself, he was playing with the Beatles in Chester, wasn't he? Was that, uh, what did you think about that? Did you think, aye, aye, things are going to carry on like this? Well, I knew John from the beginning, so it made no difference to me. <laughs> it was just, I mean, our marriage was a, was a bizarre uh, marriage under any circumstances and but it was what we were used to we were only children i mean when you look back and uh, i was 20 21 john was 20 i was 21 and john was say 20 and we were babies i mean i look at my son now and i think my god you know what we did then i dread to think what what he how he would cope with it mm. you know at this time in his life how did John take to fatherhood? Because it must have been difficult for somebody who hadn't really had a father of his own, although he was still alive, he was far I think, away. I think when he first saw Julian, I think that the absolute magic and novelty of it was so much that the responsibility, he, he, had, he wasn't aware of the responsibility of being a father because it happened so quickly. Um, but later on, of course, you know, I think he realized it suddenly came home to him that he was a father and responsible for a, a young child. But at the time, he was still a student. We were virtually just out of short socks and gym slips or short pants. And, you know. mm. As the success grew, you were installed in Weybridge. Now, you were a homemaker and you did your own arts and crafts and so on, but do you think you would do the same again or would you get out there into that Beatles world and make your desires known? Oh, no, because my desires were known anyway. I mean, that, because I was a homemaker and a mother, I mean, that, that was what which uh, presented itself to me at the time. And I believe that I'd do my best at whatever is presented to me. But I wouldn't have been any different because I had my standards and my characteristics any more than John had his standards, characteristics. But I wouldn't know, you know, I wouldn't have changed a thing. How did you feel about the songs as they come, came out? It says somewhere in the book that you must have begun to feel that there were messages, signs of another life that he was leading, creeping into. Norwegian Wood, I think, is an example that is Well, it was, given. Over, it was over a period of five or six years, and a lot of other things were happening at the same time. And a lot of things, I mean, John wrote music with Paul and George and Bingo, and they worked together. So for me, it wasn't necessarily what was happening to John that was coming out in his music. It was happening to all of them at the same time. So I couldn't pinpoint any particular thing or, I mean, like Norwegian Wood. I mean, I realized afterwards, because I was told why, you know, the reason for writing Norwegian Wood was because, you know, of a um, little flirtation on the side or what have you. But I mean, at the time, I just, I was fascinated by their music and their progress. And no, I wasn't thinking of mm. messages particularly. Do you listen to those songs now? Do you have them? Well, I haven't got any rec of John's records or tapes. 
uh, at the moment because Julian pinched them off me. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, all contribu contributions, are, you know, are welcome. But um, I don't have to listen to them because they're on the radio and they're constantly being played. You know, it's legacy of the Beatles, which is beautiful. Mm. You didn't follow John into the drug thing. What do you think he was looking for in that? What did he expect to get out of it? Well, I think John, John had such an open mind. He was so fascinated with, with anything extraordinary or out of the ordinary or, or not unorthodox. And they presented themselves to him. He was an open-minded man and he just accepted them and tried them. Uh, as far as I was concerned, I, I wasn't in that sort of circle most of the time. So it really didn't hit me. I wasn't pressurized with that, that sort of scene as much as he was, mm. or most musicians. When volume two does come out, is that something that you will read? Will you be able to? Oh, I hope that? so, yes, I hope so. <laughs> mm. Because, I mean, it's still, I mean, the whole story of the Beatles, story of John, John's life is very precious to me. And I'm a person that wants justice. So volume one, you, you approve of? This is the right stuff? Well, volume one, I, I assisted Ray Coleman because I felt that I'm, I was so sick to death of reading accounts and stories and inaccuracies in certain other books that I just couldn't believe and that I wanted desperately, if Ray was going to write a book, to assist him and point him in the right direction to people that really loved John, really knew John, mm -hmm. and really cared about his memory, not someone who was going to write something just for a fortune yeah. you know, and sensationalism. Well, Paul, you've read the book. Do you feel you know John better now? Well, I absolutely agree with what Cynthia has just said. Uh, before Ray started writing this book, he took me to lunch and, and asked me for my opinions on his approach. This is a very loving and protective book, unlike some of the others that have surfaced recently. Even when the negative bits come up, it's done in the framework of, well, there may have been drug use, but it wasn't as bad as you've read, or there were girls on the road, but it wasn't the orgies you've heard about. Brian may have been attracted to him, but that wasn't the main reason he signed up the Beatles, and even so, it was okay anyway. It is something where he actually cares about John Lennon, and this is in stark contrast to uh, the recent major book, which was basically a scandal sheet by Peter Brown, and Philip Norman's book, which is very entertaining, a show business book written in a very flowery style, but focusing on the phenomenon of the group rather than on the individual. I was quite amazed that, that Cynthia did have the courage to loan Ray Coleman some of the letters that John had written to you, which are very revealing, not only because they showed how much he loved you, but how much he loved some other things in his life. There's a line in one of the letters where he says, I love you like guitars. And I yes. thought that says so much. It shows how much he loved the music as well as yourself. But it shows you that he was a loving man and a caring man. And so many of the books have portrayed him as a very harsh, cruel, an insensitive man. And John, John was like all human being, beings. He was vulnerable. He was an individual. He fought. He had a lot of pain. But above all else, John was honest to his own pain. I mean, he, he was so honest that it created pain for himself. Is there a kind of vulnerability that you recognize sort of professionally? There actually? is. One of the things I, I, I wanted to ask you was that in the book, it seems as if that vulnerability with this harsh, often rather cruel shell is traced back to uh, when he was five, maybe a bit younger than that, and the battle between his mother and father about his actual disposal. Well, was, was that something he talked about? Because where else would the details of that emotional impact have come from? Well, the details would have come from Auntie Mimi, who was closer. I mean, I didn't meet John till I was 16, 17. But uh, Auntie Mimi was so close to John. She was virtually his second mother. And she wouldn't know all about it. It was a very close family. Was it something he talked about? Was he someone who talked about his feelings? Because I sensed in his use of drugs a way of sort of releasing himself in ways that he didn't normally find very easy. I think his release was in his... Music, music and his words and drugs. I think that was his ultimate high uh, in life was when he um, stumbled across LSD. Well, he didn't stumble, somebody pushed it or put it in our coffee or what have you, but mm. I think when he realized the freedom from that pain that he'd had as a child and growing up and constantly battling and being a very basic coward, John was a basic coward, mm. 
any more than an awful lot of us are when we're very nervous and get very frightened about things. John had, did have this exterior of being the hard knock, mm. but he wasn't a hard knock at all. Do you feel, hang on, this is our story, and everybody writing about it is a great insult? Well, it is an insult. It is, and I think it's um, time that somebody said something that was, to John's credit, to John's um, strength as a man and as a talent and as an individual, as opposed to sensationalizing his life. <sighs> I've said it before and I can't say it anymore. I just believe in justice in life. And this man cannot speak for himself anymore, any more than Brian Epstein can speak for himself. I said you know, so I believe it's very important that the people that loved him and knew him say something good for the man because he was a good man. Russell, in his introduction, said it might have been different. As I read the book, some of the things you say suggest to me that in a strange kind of way it could never have been different. That well, he just was not harnessable in a, in a strange kind of way. No, I don't think he was. No. But then again, uh, he wouldn't have been the talent he was if he had been harnessable. I believe that all his experience produced beautiful music from being a young child, he used to write his own stories and his own cartoons, draw his own cartoons. <sighs> Following on to teenage, when he would be a rebel and fight every, um, anyone in superiority or in, in any sort of form, shape or form of superiority. He, he had to have his freedom to produce what he did produce. And we have that legacy of his music now and his books and uh, his witticisms and his truth. I couldn't involve myself in anybody else's story about John. This is very, very important to me. It's hopefully the last time I have to discuss it. <laughs> Sounds as if the book can do nothing but good. Thank you all very much.